it's great to see all of you. It's great to see so many friends. Great to see so much interest in this topic. Many thanks to Mira for, and her team for bringing us all together. Um, and I think Mira has brought us into uh, un, relatively uncharted territory, which I'm very excited about. What is an ethics of childhood? What is a framework for thinking about ethics in children? And we are at a time when there are many competing claims. Schools have claims. Parents have ethical claims. Teachers have ethical responsibilities and claims. The broader public and politicians are making ethical claims and some crazy unethical claims um, about schools. Um, so I think this is a terrific time to be taking on this topic. Uh, and we have three terrific people who are going to lead us in this discussion. One is Harry Brickhouse, who is the professor of philosophy uh, and humanities at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Great to see you, Harry. Uh, Paula Fass is the Margaret Byrne Professor of History at University of California, Berkeley. And Figeli Numalo is an Assistant Prep Professor, Department of Curriculum Teaching and Learning, Ontario Institute of Studies at the University of Toronto. Um, and there are lo longer bios for all these folks that you, that you can read. So without further ado, I think we're going to get started. And Paula is going to kick us off. Let's go. Good morning. So the last session was very intensely focused on ethics. I am not an ethicist. Uh, I am a historian, and I thought that we would broaden out a little bit, and that what I could contribute to both this session and to the larger conference is a historical context for why we're gathered here. Uh, what has brought, why is it that today we're talking about children and ethics, we're talking about schooling and ethics. When 100 years ago, um, that question would have seemed odd to our predecessors. And 400 years ago, when this great university was founded, it would have seemed bizarre. Uh, so I would like, to, I'd like to, to, to address this deeper history, not just what happened in Florida yesterday, or what happened in Texas last week, which we sometimes confuse with history, but really talk more deeply about a longer history. So I'd like to, uh, I'd like to start with, uh, with the first slide. And I, I should also say that the reason I brought these slides is that Mira convinced me that historians have wonderful material to show and illustrate. So I ran frantically to find some. So this is the first one I have for you. It's a, a print of a group of children at school that was published 170 years ago. The exact date was November 1855 in the Ladies' Repository, one of the proliferating journals addressed to American women. Note the unhappy faces of the, of the children. And it's both girls and boys. I mean, the United States had girls and boys mixed in classrooms. And that was quite unusual, actually, in terms of other places. Uh, and the dunce cap. Unfortunately, we are still familiar with unhappy faces of children, although the dunce cap, thank goodness, is no longer part of our experience. Historically, schools were established not to please young people, but for moral, religious, and political purposes considered important to adults. Some of the earliest schools, like those in France in the 16th century, were a direct response to the desire to encourage morality in children. In Sweden, a century later, their purpose was religious indoctrination, as was the case in England and in the co American colonies in the 18th century. Throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, schools became an essential expression of nationalism the new creation of various nation states, and were intended to inculcate patriotic values and to create and uphold standards of citizenship. In all of these cases, and this should come as no surprise, they subordinated the interests of the child to a larger purpose, and by definition, that purpose was social. Of course, schools have also served the purposes of parents both in the past and today. 
when they are instruments of economic and status aspirations, among other, among other aspirations. But history is never simple, and its path is often crooked. And that happens to be the case in regard to children. This very same period of time and these very same schools with their blatant social purposes and some of the same people who helped establish them also provided the seedbeds for a new perspective on children and childhood. It is this new elevation of childhood that lies behind the attention we are giving to this subject here today and tomorrow. Starting in the 17th and 18th centuries, the notion of childhood began to evolve in directions that increasingly, increasingly valued the integrity of the child and toward a vision in which adults had obligations towards children. In other words, the child was not simply an object to be manipulated, but a sensitive being to be respected. Childhood, as the historian and demographer Philippe Ariège showed more than half a century ago, became conspicuously a separate category of personhood by the 17th century, with particular needs to which educators were to apply themselves. The political philosopher John Locke at the end of that century, the end of the 17th century, envisioned the potentials of the child as a positive source for political liberty the origins of our concerns with democracy today, and argued that physical punishment was an abuse of power. By the middle of the 18th century, Jean-Jacques Rousseau introduced a radical perspective on the child, which saw his, and I mean his in this particular case, special intellectual capacities as not just worthy of attention, but fundamental to human improvement. As an expression of nature, the child was born good, innocent, and worthy of study. The 19th century took these visions into reform directions, as men and women throughout the West hoped to preserve the innocence of children and to shield them from abuse and exploitation. The century is full of movements on behalf of children and child protection which becomes a driving political force in England, the United States, France, Sweden, and many other places. Reformers targeted sexual exploitation, factory labor, and family neglect. This drive rested on a sensibility about the special qualities of childhood to which we are still committed. We need only to recall the children in Dickens to understand how this sensibility was spread far and wide in Europe and in North America. Second slide, please. It was also captured in illustrations that became commonplace in middle class homes. You'll pardon this very amateurish version of my own uh, illustration of this. This is probably the most famous illustration that was used throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. It's a print by Sir Joshua Reynolds called The Age of Innocence. By the end of the 19th century, an ideal childhood was proposed as a magical realm, protected from the grime of adulthood in the nurse, through the nursery and the schoolroom, and enshrined in a literature of its own, a literature with which we are still familiar and which we still read to our children, which I'll capture just in two Peters, Peter Pan and Peter Rabbit. <laughs> By the turn of the 20th century, it was a basic tenet of many political and social leaders that children should not work, which they had done very frequently in the past, but that leisure and play were their natural spheres and that they belonged in school. In addition to the playground, the schoolhouse became the site of childhood, and children belonged there for longer and longer periods of time, indeed from kindergarten through puberty. It was quite natural then that it was to schools that reform-minded people, such as John Dewey and Maria Montessori, turned their attention. I will not go into details here about how these reforms have defined and challenged 20th century schooling, or how they continue to define our agendas about the ethics of childhood today. I am sure that there will be plenty of discussions about this special childhood site, i.e. the school,
during the rest of this conference and my time is limited. But I do want to conclude by noting three potentially contradictory matters that emerged in the 20th century. First, the campaign to protect children intensified in the 20th century. In the United States, for example, the early century saw the founding of the Children's Bureau, which by the way no longer exists, but was really an expression of this reform agenda. But that hardly governed the actual behavior of nations at war during which children became in the 20th century victims of brutal campaigns and genocide. It was in this context that the rights of children became part of the agendas of international organizations. These organizations began to frame children's rights in terms of the ethics of personhood as they sought to aid in feeding children and protecting them from labor and sexual exploitation in international traffic. Second, the 20th century has seen the extraordinary movement of peoples across the globe, the result of war and expulsions as well as choice. These movements involve children whose needs have come to the attention of reformers and school people who have inherited the ideas I, have I hope I've laid out and who are deeply committed to having these children put into safe places such as schools. The rights of these children have increasingly been enshrined in various documents, most recently and prominently in the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of the Child. Finally, during the same 20th century, schooling has become ever more part of the agenda of nations eager to absorb migrating children. In the early 20th century, the education of the children of immigrants was probably the most important reason for the democratization of schooling and for its vast extension, both into infancy, kindergartens, and today earlier than that, and into later ages in the United States. By democratization, what was usually meant was incorporation and not necessarily what Dewey had in mind by this concept. Thus the paradox, or at least one of them, children to learn from their children need to learn from their new environments. But we also want them to be respected for who they are and for what they bring. Today, education as a right and education as a necessity for citizenship have come together not always comfortably and, more, and in a much more pluralistic context than ever before. And this, I believe, is the context with which we are dealing today in terms of ethics, children, and schooling. I hope I've suggested how for reasons that go, reach back for centuries and that are deeply embedded in the last 100 years, we've come to this conference that asks us to consider the ethics of education. And in this panel specifically, the ethics of education and children. Thank you. Thank you, Paula and Figali. And, and just so you know, we'll have the three speakers. We'll have some time for you to digest what the speakers are saying. I will launch into a conversation with them, and then we will open it up for Q&A. Sure, go ahead. Great, thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here. So for myself, one entry point for me in engaging with educational ethics within the context of my work, which aims to re respond to the interconnections between environmental precarity, anti-blackness, and settler colonialism in the context of early childhood education, I'm interested in possibilities for education with and for young children to center relationality as an ethical commitment that is also a pedagogical and epistemological commitment. Relationality is an ethical orientation that requires reciprocity and obligation within current and between current and future generations, lands, waters, and animal and plant life. Importantly, I'm interested in relationality as an ethical commitment in early childhood education that is not only against human supremacy, but is intentionally anti-colonial and works for the thriving of black and indigenous children and childhoods. Put another way, I'm interested in possibilities for centering an ecological ethics in early childhood education in ways that center, as I mentioned, reciprocal relationality with the more than human world, while also responding to the ways in which ecological precarity is entangled with human injustices, such as those, as I mentioned, due to anti-blackness and settler colonialism. 
In a recent editorial, um, Dr. Eve Tuck, Priti Nayak, and myself wrote that this is an important challenge given that Euro-Western education remains largely invested in re reproducing hierarchicized neoliberal capitalist formations of the human. Relatedly, dominant ways of responding to ecological precarity remain tethered to human exceptionalism. So in thinking through how ethical commitments towards re reciprocal relationality with the more than human world can respond to anti-blackness by centering black children's thriving, I've turned to black ecologies as an orientation that I see as an important ethical refusal of narratives that define black relations with the more than human world, predominantly through loss and lack. Brought to context of my work uh, of, in early childhood education in Canada, I found that black ecologies are filled with possibilities for reimagining pedagogies and curriculum that story black land relations in ways that unsettle discourses of a separatedness between black people and the more than human world, while also engaging with the realities of anti-blackness in en environmental precarity. And so black ecologies enact a rupturing of the repetitions of human supremacy, as I mentioned, that continue to shape environmental education, where this human is always already racially and colonially hierarchized. As pedagogical orientations, black ecologies ask early childhood educators to make ethical commitments towards a relational rather than a colonial deficit individualist lens to think alongside black children in relation with more than human worlds. And so there are provocation for educators to consider how their pedagogical encounters, as I mentioned, require ethical refusal to keep in place the deficit and extractive logics of environmental education, as for instance, a fixative for certain black children. Put differently, black ecologies invite ethical commitments to witnessing in affirmative ways the relational and creative ways in which black childhoods are continuously remade in particular contexts. So an ethical commitment towards the thriving of black children amidst inequitably, inequitably distributed ecological precarity invites ethical questions such as, and I think the, the responses to these are always situated and contextual, what desired conditions are necessary for livable and flourishing black childhood futures? How can early childhood education become a site at which to, to enact, to dream, and to imagine in place black liberation? What kinds of ethical refusals might be needed to enact such thriving and sustainable worlds in early childhood contexts? So for instance, I've written about um, ethical and pedagogical commitments towards black ecologies and how they might involve work that seeks out black ecologies and geographies that might not necessarily, that might not be readily visible, but are always present despite their absenting. I've also written about pedagogical practices of what I call testifying witnessing as nodes of noticing, documenting, and responding to emergent ecological relations between black children and the more than human world. In thinking through how such ethical commitments towards reciprocal relationality can respond to settler colonialism, I've turned to refiguring presences, also what I see as an ethical commitment, as a way of conceptualizing what it might look like pedagogically to refuse erasure of indigenous people's lands onto epistemologies and relations from specific places. So in my work, I'm interested um, in refiguring presences as, as ethical practices that encounter indigenous onto epistemologies and land relations as always already present, again, despite the effects of settler colonialism. One pedagogical tactic of refiguring presences is the use of situated place stories that are aimed at interrupting the absent presences imposed by settler colonialism in pedagogical encounters with outdoor places, um, which has become quite romanticized in my field of early childhood education. Another pedagogical tactic is to bring forward to children the indigenous ontologies that recognize the vibrancy and agency of lands and waters, disrupting extractive relations with nature as simply a mute backdrop for young children's discoveries. And this is an important, I think, interruption of Anthropocene discourses that are implicated, and this is a quote, in subsuming or suturing over the ways in which indigenous ways of knowing um, have been thinking and practicing co-constitutive relations to more than human worlds since time immemorial. Such pedagogies are responsive to a particular place and in relation with specific communities, so not as approaches to be transferred to different contexts. Instead, they're an invitation, again, to ethical questions to ask um, what it might mean to commit to an ethological, ecological ethics that is grounded in anti-colonial commitments. And for instance, just to finish off, um, in my work with young children and kindergarten teachers in the context um, of the United States and Austin, what is now Austin, Texas, I've written about interdisciplinary curriculum making with the creek that bordered the school. In this work, situated indigenous place stories and arts-based practices 
were pedagogical and curricular provocations for anti-colonial ethical commitments. We engaged in multiple ways of knowing aimed at opening up what counts as important in learning with and about climate change in young children's worlds. And so our pedagogies included learning alongside a Kowitakan educator, learning a Kowitakan water song, which children often sang spontaneously to the creek, cleaning up the creek, storytelling about indigenous water protectors as we sat alongside the creek, um, art making as an effective response to being in relation with the creek, learning with the human and more than human effects of flooding in Austin in relation to the creek waters, and troubling human nature binaries by taking walks that fo followed human-made tunnel creek pathways. Importantly, this anti-colonial work also included intentional attention to black children's learning in relation with indigenous relational knowledges as an ethical commitment towards creating pedagogical invitations for black indigenous and black indigenous peoples and knowledges to be in relation. And I'll end there, thank you. Thanks. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, good. I, there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to. So they both told me that they weren't going to talk about ethics, but then they went ahead and talked about ethics. Uh, and it's sort of interesting that they thought they weren't going to talk about ethics. Um, I would like to open, actually, with a, with a letter, an email that I received. And this takes off from the previous panel. Um, this is from a student who took my philosophy class the first time I taught the normative case studies and then became a special ed teacher in a low-income school. A couple of months in, she said, I wish we'd had more philosophy classes in the School of Education. The readings we did were more realistic in philosophy, whereas in my School of Ed classes, they were more idealistic. Uh, in my practice, I'd see teachers facing problems like the ones we talked about in philosophy every day, multiple times a day. But in our content classes, there were very real problems were watered down and approached in terms of ideal theory. We talked about the benefits of, of inclusion, but we never talked about how this looked in imperfect practice. Um, and you might think, oh, that's great. We need to work for uh, ethicists. Uh, that you also might think, oh, that is terrible that the most practically useful class that somebody took when they're preparing to be a teacher was their philosophy class. Um, that's, you know, what can you do? Uh, but I, I think there's a reason why she uh, thought that. So, so Ethics is really all about trade-offs, and it's about making trade-offs very explicit and very, uh, being very self-conscious about them. And of course, one of the problems that we talked about in the previous panel is, you know, you don't have a lot of time, and so you have to think about these things beforehand. Um, and when, you're doing, when we're talking about trade-offs, we're talking about trade-offs of value, right? So it's not, I mean, when trade-offs are always trade-offs of different things that matter, um, and that you can't realize in the circumstances uh, perfectly as much as you'd like. So you have to think about how you're going to do it. And so what I want to do to, uh, in my little contribution is to just invite you to think about a certain set of values um, that are the values that I, I just invite you to think about them as the ones that you might be trading off, both uh, that might be relevant both to classroom decision making, um, but also might be relevant to uh, decision making about who teaches whom. Um, how you allocate teachers, but also might be uh, relevant to how you think about uh, funding, how you allocate funding, how much funding you allocate, um, and how you situate the school in the rest of society. Um, I think of uh, education as primarily being about two things. One is uh, the flourishing of the students. I know that doesn't sound very helpful. Uh, I'll say a little bit more about it in a moment. Um, and the other is about their ability an inclination to contribute to the flourishing of other people. If you like, you know, that's the way I think of uh, the contribution of schooling to the public good. Um, and flourishing is an essentially concept, uh, contested concept. Um, we would probably, I, th I don't know how many people there are in the room, room but there's probably that um, number of concepts of flourishing in the room minus one, because I know there's at least one person in the room who has exactly my conception. Um, uh, so that's good. Um, uh, if you're actually a teacher or if you're trying to make these decisions, you want to break that down. Flourishing isn't going to be very helpful. But there are, I think we can identify five capacities um, that will help people to flourish and help them to contribute to the flourishing of others pretty much on any plausible conception of flourishing. And they are the capacity con to contribute 
uh, to, uh, to, sorry, to participate effectively in the economy where the economy is broadly conceived, um, the capacity for personal autonomy, the capacity to make your own uh, independent judgments about matters of value and matters of importance, and then act on them, uh, the capacity for democratic citizenship, uh, even in non-democracies, the capacity for democratic citizenship might be important, though how it actually looks and how it is actually realized might be different, and that's an important thing about all these capacities. How you realize them will depend on context. Um, the capacity for healthy uh, personal relationships, and then the capacity for what I think of rather imperfectly as personal uh, fulfillment. Um, my uh, friend and collaborator, Susanna Loeb, uh, when, I, when we talk about personal fulfillment, says, hobbies. Uh, uh, I, I don't know it's exactly right. That's exactly the right way of thinking about it. But, but yeah, you know, hobbies and then jokes. She likes, she, she likes to talk about jokes as well. Um, I think it's maybe deeper than that. Um, now, as I say, how they're realized is going to look different in different uh, contexts. So think about, you know, think about the, simply the capacity to participate effectively in the economy. Um, uh, typesetting. Typesetting is my favorite example because when I was a kid, typesetting was an extremely lucrative skill. If you could learn how to be a good typesetter, you could make real money. And by the time I was about 28, it was like a niche, <laughs> it was like being a blacksmith. Like it went from being this tremendously valuable skill in the economy to being completely worthless, essentially. It was something that you would only do, you know. It, Sorry, I know there are chess players in the room. I was going to say, like playing chess. Uh, but you know what I mean? It's sort of, um, uh, and, and there are lots of, what you need to be a good democratic citizenship, uh, good democratic citizen in the UK is different from in France, is different from in the US, and is probably different in Massachusetts than it is in uh, Wisconsin, where uh, I come from. Now, when you're trying to p promote these capacities, uh, you are going to come into conflict with some other values. Um, and we, my co-authors and I, sort of think about these in uh, several ways. We sort of think of these values. Um, I'm just going to mention the interests of families. And although the capacities are all focused on the children, the interests of children themselves, right? And so the thing about childhood is it's not merely a preparation for life. It is actually part of life itself. Um, and when we went from uh, essentially imprisoning children in these schools, no child goes to any school out of their own choice. They go out to school because somebody else compelled them to. And then they're in a room with 20, 25, 30 other people who they didn't choose to be around, one or two of whom are quite cruel, right? And about a third of the people in this room were bullied in, in school. Um, and some percentage of that third were bullied quite seriously. Uh, and for some people, that really harmed them academically and in the long term. And for some, it didn't. But even if it didn't, uh, and even if, as I suspect in the case of my bullying, I think I probably benefited from it in some ways in the long term because, you know, I knuckled down and focused on school and this, that, and the other. Um, uh, even if you benefited, still there was something quite wrong about it. And uh, schools and teachers need to think carefully about how they're going to protect the daily lived experience of the children, even when doing that involves a trade-off uh, with the long-term benefit to that child um, themselves. Uh, I know I've got 22 seconds. The other category uh, that I was thinking about um, is, is the interests of families. And obviously, sort of one way of thinking about this is the interest, people think about this often in terms of the interests of religious parents um, wanting to have control. But I don't think you should think about it that way. Uh, I, we have a long history of treating some kinds of families and parents very carefully and thinking very thoughtfully about their interests when we, they interact with schools. And uh, working class parents, um, immigrant parents, black parents, uh, and families not thinking quite so carefully and not playing as much regard to their interests and to the integrity of their relationship with their children and their communities. Um, sometimes there will be trade-offs between that and academic success. Um, and ethics is about thinking about how you manage those trade-offs.
thank you. Uh, thank you all the, to the panelists. Um, this is all very thought-provoking and helpful. What I'm going to suggest now is just take a few minutes. I think you did this the last time. Talk to a neighbor. Try and think about, digest what you just heard. Then I will engage the panelists in conversation. Then I will we'll open it up to your questions and thoughts. So I, I actually knew. Hey folks, we just started.
It went off. There we go. Sorry. Um, let me just start with a question for Paula. Paula gave us a wonderful history of how ethics schools responsibility to teach ethics has been conceptualized or to teach kids to be moral or citizens has been conceptualized in different eras um, in our history. I'm question for her and for all of you is where do you think we've landed now in terms of how schools conceive of their responsibility to teach ethics, um, to raise good citizens, moral people? And where do you think we should be? Um, what, what kind of ethics or morality do you think we should be teaching in schools? Well, as you well know, that's an incredibly complicated yes, question. Yes, I do. And it's, in fact, two questions. Yes. This is where we are now and, and where we should go. Um, our heart may be in the right place now, because I, as I suggested, we have all of these predecessors who have taught us that we should be respecting children and respecting childhood and looking to them. But in fact, that is not exactly where we are, um, not only because uh, schools are being judged by the, by the uh, performance of their children, as, as we know, but because uh, we are, we've taken over the Deweyite idea of paying attention to the needs of the child in ways that are almost necessary in a democratic school system, and that is it's very difficult to address each child in a school system. And one of the results of Deweyite ideals in the 1920s and 30s and beyond was the categorization of children and the tracking of children. This is not something that Dewey would have had in mind as ideal. But it was tracking according to ability groups. Uh, and it was, a, I would describe that as a, an almost necessary response to the, the simultaneous democratization of schools and, and bringing all these very different children in. IQ testing, as I have written about, was one of the responses to that. And uh, we, know, we all here uh, know what the, uh, what the problematics of IQ testing is. I worry that we are now in a situation of a different kind of categorization. Um, categorizing not by tracking groups so much, but categorizing children by their home sites. Um, in other words, whether they're Hispanic or whether they're black or whether they're Asian American or whether they're native, uh, whether they're Caribbean African or whether they're African African or if they're African American, categorization has become a way of coping with the individual needs of children. Um, and it's understandable whether it's the right thing and whether it's where we should be going. That's the question I will leave open to others to discuss. Um, I can say a little bit within the context of early childhood education and yeah. the Canadian context. I would say I've been encouraged by certain early learning frameworks that have been developed by certain provinces that have been quite explicit in terms of, you know, pedagogy as requiring engaging with ethical questions with young children um, and pedagogical documentation or narration as a way to kind of open that up, those kinds of inquiry-based um, engagements with young children. Um, but of course, the field remains quite fragmented in terms of you know, which are the kinds of early learning settings where children do have um, those possibilities, uh, like the inquiry-based learning that I gave the example of with young children. Um, but I have also worked with educators also within quite constricted environments, like the context of Austin, Texas, where educators are able to find the cracks to do that work, even in a um, a quite restrictive environment, but of course it shouldn't be up to you know educators to like find innovative ways to engage with questions of ethics with children. Mm -hmm. So I see there's some like policy things that have been great in the Canadian context, um, but in my work in the U.S. context, it's been mainly um, just being inspired by educators who find the cracks and the possibilities to do that work. Um, so yeah, that's what great. I would say. Thank you. Thank you. So there's more to it than uh, what you teach them in the classroom. Um, the, way that you, the way that you manage and conduct a school uh, 
is a way of conveying to children what matters, how they should behave, etc. Um, I'm really struck by the, the the large comprehensive high school that, that 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 which I know is a sort of it really was developed in the 40s and 50s, but four years. 500, 600, 700 children in, per year in a single building or a single set of buildings. Um, I'm not where of necessity discipline is sort of semi-military, right? It's like you can't have, you can't have uh, policing by consent mm -hmm. um, because teachers don't know every kid in the, you know, they walk down the hall, they don't know half the kids, the half the kids don't know them, they don't have the kind of authority that you have when you have a relationship with somebody. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and that is character forming, being mm -hmm. in an environment like that rather than another kind of environment. Mm -hmm. So I'm sounding really critical of the large comprehensive high school, because I am. But um, uh, maybe that is the best way of doing it. I mean, you know, maybe that is a sensible way of doing it, but thinking about those, those issues, thinking about um, how you actually, what kinds of institution you put people in, um, and thinking how you manage the daily experience yeah. um, is itself uh, teaching ethics, it is itself teaching character. Yeah. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. I really think, Harry, that that's exactly right. Um, uh, I, have, I have not only thought about high schools, but I've done some of my research in high schools. And so I have visited high schools as a researcher, and I've seen the, the experiences of high school students, and also the differences, the different tones that are set in different places. But the, first of all, the larger institutional uh, setting is the same, but you know, principles can make a huge difference. Yeah. A huge difference. I, I, I studied New York high schools, and I went to a variety of different ones. And what I, what I saw was from total indiscipline with kids carrying knives in their pockets to happy discipline, not a prison-like discipline. So I do think that is a serious ethical matter, uh, how those things are, are led, how they're, how they're const constructed and constrained. So I, I just wanted to say amen to that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you'd probably get quite, a, maybe not, quite a lot of agreement in this group that curriculum matters much less than relationships and culture in schools. And, um, you know, kids are razor sharp alert to hypocrisy, right? So if you have a curriculum and you have poisonous relationships or dishonesty or bullying or whatever, um, those things stick out and become very troubling. But Harry, let, let me just let me just add, push you on about one thing because you said one of the capacities that you want kids to develop is to be democratic citizens. And, and you know, part of what I met is like, within that category, what is it schools should be doing? Um, and, and these are very contested. Should, should we be teaching kids what justice is and how to pursue it as part of democratic citizenship? Should we be teaching kids about inequity, racial inequity? Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. But but complicated at this moment. But, yeah, very complicated. So um, and what we don't want is, you know, social justice and equity are both contested concepts. Again, you know, again, there's lots of different conceptions of them in this room. Uh, we don't want teachers themselves thinking, well, my conception of this, I'm going to teach you that. You're going you're gonna to believe what I think. Um, uh, and that's not particularly helpful. We want them to know all sorts of stuff about their particular, you know, the history of the political system they're in, how to do things effectively. But we also want them to be able to exchange reasons, mm -hmm. um, and that's you know that's and that's something schools have a, they've got a real comparative advantage. There's almost nowhere else in 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 the public culture where children are going to learn how to exchange reasons about difficult and controversial questions where they really genuinely disagree with people. Mm -hmm. Schools are not as diverse as they should be, especially in the US. They're not much more diverse yeah. than the neighborhoods, yeah. but they're more diverse than families. Yeah. And you are more likely to encounter people who, who have different experiences, disagree with you uh, in a school and in a family. And creating an environment in which, you know, from quite young, where you are used to 
expressing disagreement in a respectful, thoughtful way, in a way that is trying to win the other person over and is compatible with continuing to be friends with or becoming friends with that person. Mm -hmm. that's, that's something, that, and, and that doesn't have to be in civics. Yeah, yeah. We should, you know, that should be happening in English. It should be happening in, ma in math. I mean, uh, I, you've got to get the math right, just, but, you know. <laughs> uh, um, so, it's, and, and it should be happening among the teachers, you know. Is it happening? I'm, 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 the, I'm the philosopher, not the, <laughs> not the empirical <laughs> social scientist. We've got, we've, we've got people who know that here yeah. in the room. Yeah. I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> um, Fugue, let, me, let me turn to you with a different question. Um, and, and thank you. The, um, you know, there are many educators who are listening here, some of whom are early childhood educators, others who are uh, educators in K-12 or in higher ed. And I wonder if you could speak concretely to what your thoughts, the insights you shared with us mean for where should educators get started on this work um, in very different contexts, not just in early childhood, but in uh, higher grades as well. Yeah, I mean, there's many different entry points. And I think, um, as I mentioned, it, this is like situated work. But I think responding to the place of where you are, the ecological challenges of where you are, um, I find that it's, um, it works well with children to respond to th something that's an immediate concern, like that example that I gave of working um, with children quite closely with the creek that was quite polluted, that was next to their school, that became an entry point to have those conversations, not only about um, like the ecological precarity, but in terms of um, indigenous ways of knowing and relating to waters. Um, and so also an important um, w thing is to think about how some that work is not only situated within a particular subject, like for instance, how climate is often um, put within the question of science, but I'm arguing that climate raises really important ethical um, questions and commitments. And so it's something that should be a part of um, multiple subjects and conversations. But I think for me, it's been helpful to think about responding to, even though it is a huge global issue, but responding to um, the concerns that um, children um, and teachers can grapple with in their own context and the particular lands and places where they're at. Great, thanks. Well, I actually want to ask you, how would you deal with that if you're teaching in a school in West Virginia? Uh, where the, the, an, an issue of environment is a significant issue in terms of their immediate environment, and yet mm -hmm. the father is working in a coal mine. Mm -hmm. And that is also very distinctly uh, part of the, the experience of that child. How, mm -hmm. how would you yeah. deal I mean, with I don't that? have a, a universalized how-to, but I think creating the opening for the conversation. So I've done work in the context of BC where there was gonna be a pipeline that was quite contested, um, where there were families that work you know, in the fossil fuel industry, but you know, there were educators that were quite against that. And so um, we just started the conversation by having a walk with the children in the forest um, where we noticed there was a lot of activity because they were doing you know, some surveying around that pipeline. And documenting that and the questions that the children were asking became an opening to have the conversation with parents around you know, what was happening and the concerns that the children had about it. Um, and I think for me, it wasn't about you know, creating a binary of like good or bad, but, but definitely raising it as something that children were worried about. They were worried about you know, the animals and the forest where the pipeline was gonna go. Um, yeah, and so to open up the conversation and not to say that there were not um, disagreements in relation to that, but I think starting it with like the questions that children were asking, um, and also, as I mentioned, like pedagogical documentation is really important in terms of making it visible to the parents and then inviting them into the inquiry and the questions that children were asking. Sounds um, wonderful. But not necessarily smoothing it over, for sure. Sounds yeah. wonderful. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Harry, let me just come back to you for a minute. I, I want, I'm, I'm a, little, a little stuck on the five capacities that you want, which I think are, which I think are great. Um, but I, but I wondered if you think, I mean, you talked a little bit about human flourishing, whether to the extent to which schools are responsible for preparing kid, kids to lead meaningful and purposeful lives. And, and I raise it because 
of the high percentage of college students is coming up in our data and um, young people who are feeling rudderless, who, you know, who don't know what they want to do with their lives. Um, and anyway, I'm, I'm just I'm interested in your thoughts about this. So, okay, like, how long have you got? Um, <laughs> so one thing just to say is that schools are asked to do all of these things and they are, uh, one of the mistakes is to think that they, they can only do so much without the cooperation of the rest of the culture and the rest of the society, right? And if, the eco if for example, the economy, I mean, so I, you know, I grew up in a period of very, very high unemployment, youth unemployment, and I, the kids I went to school with knew that lots of us were going to be unemployed afterwards, and that definitely, the school could do nothing about that. The school couldn't do anything about the fact that the factory that was right next to us, where most of the, parent, most of the fathers worked, um, was shedding jobs like that. Mm -hmm. And kids who, when they were seven, had thought they were going to get those jobs at 16 knew they weren't. That wasn't the school's... It, it, it had to work within that constraint, and schools have to work within these kinds of constraints. You, you know, universities and colleges are actually better funded, um, and so have, maybe have slightly l less constraints. Um, but you are... So yeah, of course, I think schools, one of their central thoughts should be how am I, how, how are these children um, going to end up leading purposeful, meaningful, flourishing lives? How are we going to prepare them for that in the circumstances that they're going to, that, that we can predict they're going to actually encounter? Yeah. Um, and to, uh, we, we sh I mean, sorry, it made, it made it sound like I was saying schools should do everything. Yeah, they should, but like there's, we, we shouldn't hold them to doing everything given that we are going to great lengths to make it really difficult for them to do those things, right? We have very high child poverty, right? Well, that's going to make it really difficult for schools to, you know, we don't have good technologies for ensuring that children who grow up in high concentrations of poverty learn a lot. We, we, nobody does. The way you do that is we get rid of child poverty. That's how you... Uh, um, so yeah, it's really important, but it's not something that we that schools can do on their own. You, you're looking puzzled, so I think I haven't I answered no, no, your question. No, I'm, I'm just I'm, <clears throat> I was I was not puzzled until the last comment because I I do think there's a, a lot that schools can do to help low-income kids learn at higher levels. <laughs> and I wasn't sure if you were saying that. Or, or... I'm saying that. Okay, so we might disagree about this. Yeah, I think there's a lot schools can do. But the idea that schools can, the idea that schools, even better funded than they are, can, um, we just have no evidence that schools can take children who uh, experience, you know, hunger, who experience poor health, who experience bad uh, environment, who are, who are in high stress uh, homes because their parents don't have secure employment, don't have secure homes. Uh, it's really much more difficult and much more expensive to educate children like that to a really high level, and nobody's done it. Individuals, yes, but we, we don't have a we haven't systematically been able to do that. And nor have the Finns. The fin it's not like the fin Finns have done this. They just don't have. They only have very few children in those circumstances. We've chosen to have lots of children in those circumstances, and that makes it much harder for schools. Yeah. Well. You are absolutely right. We have not done this at scale. I think we may disagree about the number of places that have done this effectively. I do think there are many schools in this country that are uh, elevating the prospects of low-income kids quite effectively. Not at any scale, for sure. Yeah. I suspect almost all schools elevate to some, I mean, no. much better to be in school than not. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think it does raise the, you know, I, I think one of the reasons I'm fussing about it is it does raise these ethical questions about, you know, if you're in a school, I mean, this is the kind of thing that happens in places like Cambridge a lot, where you're in an economically diverse environment, and parents are lobbying for a gifted class, for example. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, this happens in schools around the country. And I think we have to be able to say that, and you all may disagree about this, but as an ethical matter, we have to redress inequities in schools. So before we think about 
funding a gifted class, we really have to think, and I, and I realize they're complicated, you, know, you want an economic yeah. integrated school, et cetera. Yeah. We have to have some confidence that we can do something that will improve the prospects of low-income kids. But tell, tell me what you think about that. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah. Um, what we shouldn't do is tell schools, well, if you, it, you know, you, you, you have a 90% poverty rate. You should, your children should be doing, and we're going to fund you pretty similarly to the school that has a 10% poverty rate. And then we're going to criticize you because your students don't do as well as the students in those yeah. other schools. No, and like, that is setting people up for failure. And it's, yeah. that's, and it's wrong to do that. And it would be silly to expect that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, once in a while, a school might be able to do that, but not in any systematic yeah. way. Yeah. Anyway. We, uh, we got to wrap up this, this part. So I think it's time, thank you all. I think it's time for questions from the audience. Anyone want to kick us off? Eric. I just go ahead. Hi. Go ahead. Uh, thank you all. This was uh, fascinating. Sorry. Introduce, Introduce yourself, yourself, Eric. Oh, uh, Eric Torres, I'm a PhD uh, candidate here. Um, Really an interesting conversation. I'm, I'm wondering if um, I can turn the focus a little bit towards this issue of uh, teacher discretion in regards to like ethical polemics in schools. It's kind of a hot button issue. Um, and I, I'm just wondering how each of you think about uh, the constraints and the aspirations that educators uh, should be bound by in terms of how they think about expressing their own ideas in the classroom, especially in the, the sort of hyper, uh, you know, polarized conditions that uh, we find ourselves in. So to open to the panel. What, what do you mean by their own ideas? Uh, sort of broadly, let's say, I mean, I can give you a concrete example. Let's say that something happens in, uh, there's a, a hot button issue in the news um, that has like some, you know, politicized uh, feature. Um, the kids want to talk about it. Um, how should an educator think about themselves entering into the, the classroom the next day and, and guiding that conversation? Uh, should they be um, guided by, you know, affirming principles of justice, uh, democratic norms? Uh, do they need to be deferential to the sort of distribution of attitudes in the classroom? Um, I'm just, I'm wondering how, <laughs> feel free to pick up on, on this in another way if there are like elements of this that, that are interesting to you all, but that's kind of where I'm coming at. Yeah, yeah. And maybe think about it sort of reactively and proactively. So if a, if a student asks you, are you pro-life or pro-choice? Are you, do you want stricter border enforcement? Or do you not want stricter border enforcement? Should you share your ideas about, about that? Um, and proactively, what issues should you engage kids in, knowing that they're going to want to know where you stand or what you believe? Any, anybody want to jump in? I think it really does depend on what level of educational practice you're at. Uh, first of all, if you're at the university and you're teaching, and we are, we were reminded at the last at, at the last session that university teachers also teach and are, are faced with ethical issues. Um, I think your speech is protected. First of all. Whereas I think if you're teaching even in the high school, where your students may just be a year younger than your university students, your speech is not protected. And that's something to remember. And, um, and then if you're dealing with the kindergarten, I think you're dealing with a very different group of people again. So I think distinguishing among those levels uh, would be important to do, both proactively and reactively. Yeah, yeah. I think you want to back, back up and think, OK, what, what, what am I being guided by here? And so I think there are, two, there are two things that really might come into conflict, right? So one is you're guided by whatever your proper pedagogical aims should be. So when I think about political issues, I think I, I, my aim really uh, should be, and this is how I teach in, in college as well, it should be to enable them to learn how to reason better and how to exchange reasons with others better, right? Because that's, that's the sort of central bit of democratic citizenship that I think we're well equipped to, to do. But I also have a duty of care to them. 
So, for example, when it comes to, you know, if it comes to the, uh, you know, close the borders kind of stuff, right? Um, so it really might be that I, I, I think telling them what I think, suppose I think borders should be completely open. I doubt anybody actually thinks that here, but, you know, suppose I think uh, certainly we shouldn't be closing the borders, we should have higher immigration, et cetera. Um, it might be that, given the students I've got in the class, my duty of care should actually indicate that I probably should be telling them that. At the same time, I should, not, I should be trying not to inhibit the proper flow of reasons. I, they should, the, the students in the class should understand what the cases are for reasonable, you know, there's a, re, there's a range of reasonable views about how, how well-controlled borders should be, which range from, you know, there should be some sort of democratic control over borders to actually no, borders should be pretty much open. Um, and they should learn how to understand what the cases are and they should be able to judge for themselves. Not when they're eight. Sorry, that sounded so rude about eight-year-olds. You know, <laughs> not when they're some age. I'm not going to specify what it is. I don't, uh, but by the time they're 16, 17, 18, 19, they should be thinking, you, you know, they should be able to. And what I think should not be the thing that they come out of the classroom caring about. They should come out of the classroom caring about how they can think well about it. Any, the other you want to and, and I don't have a good answer, just that, you know, I worry when issues of equity become like up for debate. And, you know, one of the things I talk about with my pre-service teachers, I teach a course on anti-discriminatory education is about like um, how certain things should not really be debated and how playing devil's advocate in relation to, for instance, pro-life or not can actually be quite harmful. And sometimes we need to take an ethical stance and is there something, for instance, in my context in Ontario, there's like a very particular human rights code or a code of ethics that we might want to turn to so that we're not, you know, debating people's humanity. I don't know. That's kind of my thought. I appreciate the perspectives. Thanks, y'all. Yeah, I, I, I would, I'd love you to jump in. I just want to say one thing really quickly, which is I think it's worth pausing and thinking about the elementary school kid question. And I say that Pretty because good. kids are awash in news and they are thinking yeah. about... Uh, often, yeah. they know about immigration debates, even in elementary school. Um, and to not engage them seems problematic to me when, they're, when these things are on their minds. Anyway, we can, we can go on. That's why I backed off eight. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I'm speaking on behalf of one of our uh, virtual guests. Uh, Jennifer Morton asks, how do teacher work conditions and opportunities for autonomy figure in this discussion? How should we think of their flourishing within the institutional context of school? In particular, how should we think of educators flourishing when it might be in conflict with serving students' needs? Anyone take this one? No, not me. <laughs> <laughs> I always hide behind being a historian. <laughs> I can tell you what happened. Oh, you're looking at me? Yeah, you. <laughs> well, so I, I, I restricted myself to you know, children's interests and parents' interests, the other thing that I had on my list, which I'd have done if I'd had 15 minutes, is, you know, teachers' interests. And, yeah, like, teachers' interests and children's interests do come into conflict. Um, and I don't think... I, I, I don't think we should pretend that that doesn't happen, especially in, you know, it may be that we could fund and manage education in such a way that they, ne they didn't, but they often do. Like, ch teachers have an interest in having a life, they have an interest in not being totally wiped out at the end of every day and at the end of every week. Um, and in current circumstances, certainly in the schools that I know about, um, the, the, the interests of children, you know, if, if they succeed in not being exhausted, there are some needs that have not been met. Um, and it's totally... And, and furthermore, there's something deeply wrong about saying to teachers... Well, you, who've chosen to take on this job, you get, to, which is low paid and low status and the people burn out, you have to take on all of the society's burden to do all this stuff that we're not going to help you with. In fact, we're going to actively make it more difficult for you to do it by, by changing the tax code so that there are more poor kids, and, right? Um, so, of course, 
all I have to say is that we, that's an ethical question. Like, that's a question that we have to think about um, when thinking about, in, in knowledge of what the actual circumstances and conditions are, and it, with an understanding, in particular circumstances, of what the trade-offs look like. Teachers, to, in my experience, teachers are not kind to themselves in the way they make those judgments. And I think they're probably better people for that. But I think they probably were, you know, live with less good lives for that. Um, my experience with teachers is not that they are looking after themselves. It's that they're not looking after themselves enough. Uh, Thank you, Harry. Please, please introduce yourself. Hi. Um, oh, can you hear me? Um, hi, I'm Emma Aboe. I'm a PhD candidate here, at, um, okay. not at Hugsey, but at the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Um, I was really interested to hear the sort of the account of relationality with nature um, and sort of indigenous and post-colonial modes of knowing and being. Could you get to a little closer to the microphone? Okay, closer? Good, thank you. Sorry. Um, so I was saying I'm really, I was really interested to hear the sort of post-colonial indig indigenous accounts of relationality as a different kind of ontology, a different way of knowing and being. Um, but I'm also thinking about some of the other conversations we've had that have touched on equality and democracy. And I'm thinking about the philosophers who use the word relational there as well and think about relational equality and relational democracy. Um, and I'm, I, I suppose I'm interested in the question of, in the context of education, when we're in the classroom thinking about bullying, when we're teachers, well, not we're teachers, when wonderful people here are teachers, thinking about the way they relate to others in democracy, the way they relate to their students. Are we using the word relationality in the same way? Can you relate to nature, to sort of the environment, to our ecologies, in the same way that you relate to people? Are we sort of speaking over each other, or is this a, I mean, I would love if we could think about a relationality all the way through, but I, I was really curious about the sort of two different definitions of relationality that I think might be implicit on this panel. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. I think people do use it in quite different ways. And um, I'm being quite specific in that I'm talking about relationality um, in relation to the more than human world, which of course also does not um, exclude the human. Um, but I wonder if also in those conversations about um, relationality between people, how it can always be implicit that the more than human world is always a part of that, whether or not it's thought about or not. Um, yeah, that's how I would answer that in not a very articulate way. <laughs> but thank you for that question. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Kathy Bickmore from the Gilles program at University of Toronto, although I've been a visiting professor here this year. I, I've been reflecting, thank you for the conference and for this panel. Uh, which is a bit rattling because of the scope. And so one of the things I've been thinking about is the relationship between the, the what questions about ethics, what should we do, et cetera, uh, even notions of childhood, and the how. And one of the things that I appreciated very much about your presentation, Fikile, is that you gave us a different platform for thinking about where changes get made and with whom? Okay. Schools and children, especially maybe the children and their own participation. And I wonder if you might each talk a little bit more about what you think of as the actors and the processes by which it becomes possible for ethical dialogue, emotions, bodies, the natural world to be brought into schooling. I don't know whether this is really responsive to the question, but um, and, and maybe I'm just saying not this way, but the how requires a lot of evidence, and some of the evidence is sort of can be systematized, but some of the evidence that you have about how to do things is really quite embodied. And, and, and implicit. And I think one of the reasons in the last panel, you know, there was a sort of question, well, you, you know, if you had an ethicist in a school, 
would they have to have been a teacher? Um, and I think the reason people would like the, them to have been a teacher is because then they have an understanding of the way that the way that the embodied evidence that can't be systematized um, gets deployed in decision making. Um, and oh, and I think that's right. There's also all sorts of other evidence. Um, I um, I don't think you can. This doesn't apply, I don't think, to superintendents. I think there's a lot of things superintendents do that outsiders can have a very good understanding of you know, how, how that could be done better. Um, so I don't, I don't know whether that's responsive at all. Paul, are you feeling this? Well, I guess I, I'm, this may not be the right audience, but I'm old enough to remember when uh, the whole fact of schooling was being questioned in the 60s. Yeah. When people were saying that by their nature, schools are authoritarian institutions that oppress children. Uh, and somehow, we have not even raised that, that, that question, whether the school, as it has evolved, I, I was trying to suggest that over time, it has had various inculcating kinds of, of um, functions, uh, but w none of us have raised the question of whether the school should be there at all, whether by its nature the school is an, it represents authority and represents power and uh, destroys children's innocence, just to use, just to use the, the terms that I, that I had introduced. Anybody out there or here want to talk about that? Too much? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think my partial answer to that would be in relation to, I think, what was raised in the previous panel in relation to time and the conditions, um, where I found um, the work with like young children to engage in those deep ethical questions has always been in places where there's been the time to like really spend time outside, but also to just really listen to children, to allow for curriculum to be more emergent. Um, where those questions are like raised up and engaged with, and so um, my, you know, my desire would be that, you know, why isn't that in more early childhood settings where that's possible to engage in a meaningful way with ethical questions? And I work with three to five year olds mostly, and I find all the time they're asking really yeah. deep philosophical ethical yeah. questions, but they're often not, you know, taken seriously or taken up and. You know, what would it be if there was actually an ethics of early childhood that really deeply listened to children, including their relationalities that are always present? So, I would say one thing about this, Paul. You know, I think you are right that in, I remember this in the 60s that there's a very explicit idea that schools were an instrument of authoritarianism. But I also think right now at this political moment, a lot of people see, see schools as the political instrument of, of whatever party is in power. Mm -hmm. And that if at this moment there are a lot of Republicans who, a lot of people who are homeschooling their kids, wanting to send their kids to parochial schools because they don't, they think of schools as so ideologically right loaded. So they're abandoning them. And, that's, and, I mean, and, and the, what you're raising actually comes from the right Whereas it comes from the right, exactly. It came, it came from the left. That's the other thing I was going to say. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Please introduce yourself. I'm sorry, I think I went the wrong word. Which side? This side, right? Sorry. Thank you to the panelists for being here and for your time. Uh, my name is Omar Ahmed. I am a senior at the college. Uh, I wanted to ask about um, the implications of social media in the classroom and how that kind of affects the dynamics between teachers and students. And I only mention that because I have 12 nieces and nephews from elementary to high school, and I have siblings with very different political and religious beliefs. And it seems to be that they're getting the majority of, uh, you know, I guess their ideologies from social media and talking to one another. So I just wanted to see how that complicates things or if it helps out. Thank you. Social media is the exact thing I'm thinking of when I think of the ways in which we try to prevent schools from doing what it is that they're supposed to be doing. So, you know, social media and phones. And they are, they, it's as if they're designed to prevent education happening, and it's as if they're designed to undermine the well-being of children. 
I mean, it's really an amazing, really and really startling. And schools are having to, you know, how do you counteract? How do you counteract these billion-dollar industries? Um, uh, and 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 the idea and to undermine democratic deliberation to 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 ensure that people who disagree with each other learn to hate one another rather than to engage with one another. That's, it's as if social media, I, I know that nobody thought, oh, let's design it this way, but it's as if it was designed to do that. Um. Gilly or Paul, you want to weigh in on this one? Well, I think we're actually going to have a session on, um, on technology uh, tomorrow. Uh, so maybe it would be best to hold off. Um, but what I'll say from a historical point of view is that that accusation, and I don't disagree I know, with I know that. That yeah. accusation was Radio. made against the movies in the 1920s, against the television in the 1950s and 60s. In other words, all media that compete with the yeah. family and the school yeah. has, ha have been seen as problematic for well, and, instruction and of children. And books in the 1500s. I mean, and books yeah, in yeah, the 1500s. Yeah, you don't need to yeah. go. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I appreciate this point, but, but I would say, and that I've been digging into the research on social media and its impact on kids. Um, the research is really complicated. It depends. It's good for some kids. It's not good for others. On balance, it does not seem to be good for lots of kids. And I buy that, too. Um, and you do see that the introduction of smartphones in 2000, there's a spike in mental health problems in this country and many, many other countries around 2010, 2011, and tracks almost directly with the introduction of smartphones in 2011, 2012. I'm just going to make a quick plug for banning cell phones from schools, period, by the way. I just don't think they need to be there. No. <laughs> All right. Uh, why am I having this side? Thank you, Mira. <laughs> Please introduce yourself. Hi, um, I'm Sarah, but I am, uh, I'm asking a question on behalf of the folks who are live streaming the yeah. event, but it's also a moment that stood out to me in the panel and made me think a lot about how we categorize kids in schools. Um, but this is a question from Josh Shane. And he wants to know, why is meeting the needs of gifted students at odds with meeting the needs of low-income students? Would you make the same comparison of special needs to low-income or athletes to low-income? It's from Josh. I think it's for you. <laughs> so I, I didn't hear the whole question. Could you just repeat the whole question? Sorry. This is a question from Josh, who is um, watching this on live streaming. Why is meeting the needs of gifted students at odds with meeting the needs of low-income students? Would you make the same comparison of special <coughs> needs to low-income or athletes to low-income? Uh, I, I probably I would compare athletes to, to low-income. <laughs> um, because I think the answer is because schools have limited resources. Yeah. And they've got to figure out what to do with their limited resources. And they do have to make these choices all the time. And they have different constituents and stakeholders who are lobbying for certain interests. And uh, so as a principal or school leader or superintendent, you're faced with these kind of conflicts. I, I'm going to speak up on Josh's behalf. Yeah. I think that the question is asking you, why are you assuming that low-income students and students are different classes? That's okay. right. Oh, my bad. Yes, my yes. bad. Can I answer that? It's because gifted is a... If you want to understand gifted the way a philosopher might understand it, you can't assume that. Gifts are well distributed across the population. But if, certainly if you want to understand the way my, gifted the way my, my school district understands it, it means children of middle and upper middle class parents who think that their children are gifted. That, that's what it means. I mean, that, that's what that's what my. I mean, that's not the dictionary. That's that's what my school district means by it. And I think that's what you. I, I mean, I know you don't mean that. I certainly don't mean that low-income kids aren't gifted. That yeah. is not in any way what I was trying to imply. Um, what I do mean is that there are constituents of affluent parents in many communities who are advocating for gifted classes for their kids, primarily. 
Hi, my name is Judy Pace, and I'm a professor of teacher education at the University of San Francisco. And I really appreciate this conference and the panel, and my mind is exploding right now. <laughs> but one of the things that I want to get back to is the problem that schools are representative of a sort of um, authoritarian, you use the word imprisonment of children. And that's changed in a lot of ways as we've become more sensitive to the needs and interests of children. Um, but fundamentally, there's still a conflict at the core of schools, which is that attendance is coercive. And at the same time, we're really trying to address everything we've learned about the developmental and all kinds of other needs and learning needs and um, desires of children on top of everything else. And we're in this stage now where, well, not really post-COVID, but coming out of the pandemic, where we've become so much more attuned to trauma and uh, social and emotional learning and just all the difficulties that children bring to school. There's just so many things that teachers are being asked to do. Mm -hmm. So I want to refer back for a second to the dissertation that I completed here at the Ed School in 1998 on classroom authority relationships. Okay. Because what I found, how many years ago was that? 20, 25. 25 years ago. 25 years ago, I found that um, the high school teachers that I was studied were coming up with and performing all kinds of complicated strategies to win the consent of their students to their classroom agenda. And it was super complicated and super ambiguous. And that fact has only escalated. I mean, it's exponentially ex expanded over these last decades. And so on the one hand, I am so um, amazed by my students who are still enduring in becoming teachers after they've done their student teaching during the pandemic, they still are really committed to being the best teachers they wanna be. But on the other hand, I'm thinking, is it ethically responsible to be demanding so much of teachers? And we're talking about adding to their preparation, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in this conference thinking, oh my gosh, I wish I had taught all of these things that I'm thinking about right now in my courses. Mm -hmm. But we're also at the same time talking about shrinking our program because we are under enrolled. And that's because we don't have a whole lot of people out there who want to be teachers for all kinds of reasons. And so how do we, I'm sorry, this is an impossible question, but how do we reconcile you know, what we're asking of teachers? And, and we're not even talking about the political attacks because I'm in San Francisco, which is a bubble, but I've been working on the conflict campaign, as Michael Pollack and John Rogers call it, um, to try to figure out how to support teachers and how to support school leaders. So how do we reconcile all of these competing realities when we're also talking about asking teachers to do more in terms of ethical decision making? Mm. Well, Harry started by asking, not Harry, I'm so sorry. Rick. Rick started by asking where we are right now and where we're going, and it seems to me you've just answered that question. Um, one of the things to remember, and I didn't say it in my, in my little talk, but um, attendance requirements are state mandated. They, were the, they were, began to be mandated in the 1880s in the state of Massachusetts, which was the first, 1887. And then state after state after state began to mandate attendance. So those are indeed state authority that's requiring young people to attend school, young and increasingly older and older people over time to attend school. Um, they did not mandate that there be enough teachers to de deal with all of those, of those issues. What they did do was create more and more normal schools, which were meant to, to educate uh, teachers. But I'm not sure they ever taught in those normal schools all the complications that, that a teacher would, would, uh, would confront, as you were just suggesting, which has become greater and greater. Harry. Schooling is by its nature coercive. Mm -hmm. And when you have a coercive institution, you have to justify it. You have to have justification for it. 
And part of that justification can be theoretical. So, you know, I offered a sort of theoretical justification. It's in order to do these things. But part of the, theor the justification is actually um, the way you the, the way you actually realize that legitimacy, doing the right kinds of things, mm. making sure that they have the right kinds of experience. And teachers are, you know, one of the jobs of, the job is increasingly impossible, and I think that it's, that's reflected by the increasing teacher shortage. You know, we have actually, I, I guess we're, we're near the nadir of the number of actual kids we have, but you know, there is a teacher shortage. It's going to continue. It's going to get worse. It's going to get worse until something is something happens. Um, in the meantime, th those people who are in, those people who are charged with preparing teachers need to prepare them as well as they can. And I, I actually thought that my my student, uh, the email I read out, and I've had I've had a lot of other students say very similar things to me. I'm afraid, um, what they're asking for is not more, they're asking for better. And they're asking to be prepared for the actual conditions they will really face, mm -hmm. and not for some imagined set of conditions that their teachers think they ought to face. Um, uh, I'm glad that Rosette is, is she here? <laughs> I'm glad that Rosette's <laughs> nodding. <laughs> yeah, is she here? I don't see yeah. her. I'm sorry, but we've, we're, we've run over time. So you, you can, why don't you come up here and and, and talk to the panelists, but I want to give a big hand to the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it.